So now we turn our attention to God's Word. And so uh, we have been over the last number of weeks uh, hiking through the book of Acts, which tells us the unfolding uh, story, the narrative of what happened after Jesus rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and how the church grew, the gospel was being spread uh, and, and being advanced in remarkable ways. Today we land in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. Uh, a portion of, of that Cora read to us this morning. The preeminent lesson that emerges from those chapters is one that we are all familiar with. We know very well because we are on the receiving end. It's the fact that the gospel is now extended beyond the Jewish people to the Gentiles. And you don't, as a Gentile, have to become a Jew, which is a proselyte, a Gentile becoming a Jew, in order to become a follower of Jesus. You're automatically accept if you accept His forgiving love, you're grafted into the church family. And so that is the preeminent lesson that emerges from Acts chapter 10 and 11. But here we are. Most of us are Gentiles, if not all. And so there's nothing new to be shared to you with that. You're on the receiving end of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, what I'm going to do this morning, in view of the fact that it's Creation Sunday... I discovered a little piece in this narrative that resonates with the day. And it's a secondary meaning that emerges from the text, but we're going to explore that this morning. But let me give you Acts chapter 10 and 11 in a nutshell. Let's set it up properly. First of all, we're introduced to a fellow that's a Roman centurion, and his name is Cornelius. Cornelius. Now, he lives in a place called Caesarea, which is on the... the coast of the Mediterranean in Israel. And then we're introduced to a gentleman by the name of Simon Peter. You know that fellow? He's the disciple who becomes the apostle filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But he's hanging out right now in Joppa, which is also a coastal town on the Mediterranean, about a day's journey south of Caesarea. And so these are the two personalities that are uh, profiled in, in these chapters. Now, Cornelius being a Roman centurion, you would think that maybe he's a shady character because most of the Romans were opposed to um, anything Jewish or certainly the followers of Jesus. But this guy, though he's a Gentile, he's a God-fearing man. I'm not sure what that means yet because it doesn't mean he's a follower of Jesus. He prays and he helps the poor. Now, Peter is a new Jewish leader for the followers of Jesus. And he's wary, he's concerned about the Romans. If you're a follower of Jesus at this point in history and you meet up with a Roman centurion, you're a little concerned what's going to happen next. Don't forget, it was the Romans who put the nails through the hands and the feet of Jesus. So, Cornelius in Caesarea has a vision. The vision is very unusual. The vision is such that God instructs him to locate Simon Peter. He's heard about him, but he instructs him to locate him, to dispatch some servants and a soldier to go find him. And he has this vision that gives him instruction to do that. Meanwhile, Peter is having a vision of his own. Down in Joppa, he's hungry, he goes up on the roof in midday, and the Bible says that he, he, he goes into a trance. We don't really know what that means. The, the, the word in Greek is ecstasy, from which we get our word ecstasy. So there's something spiritual, there's something dyna dynamic happening. And in his vision, heaven is opened up, and a sheet begins to descend down from heaven to earth, and it comes down so low that Peter is able to look down into it. And when he looks into it, he looks into it three times, because he's trying to observe what's really there, and it's confounding. There's, there's four-footed creatures, there's reptiles of the earth, and there's birds of the sky. They're all in there mixed together. And very quickly he realizes that the rules and the regulations of Leviticus 11, which are the ceremonial laws of, of, of ancient times, were fulfilled in Jesus who becomes the sacrifice once and for all. And he realizes that, that what was declared unclean in terms of foods, once God declares it clean, it doesn't matter 
what it used to be in the past. It's clean. And so he realizes that the, the ceremonial laws are fulfilled. You can eat anything you want. God has given us freedom. But that's not the end of it. The ranks of Cornelius show up in Joppa where Peter is on the roof and they ask for him. And Peter goes, what do they want? He's concerned that there's a Roman coming to see him. What is he expecting? I mean, he's already been imprisoned. What's he expecting now? But the messengers convey Cornelius' vision to him, and then Peter says, well, I had a vision too. And he realizes that God is up to something unique here. And he, he goes with, the, with Cornelius' messengers back to Caesarea, and he meets with Cornelius, and Cornelius becomes a believer. He's a Gentile, but he becomes a follower of Jesus. And he becomes baptized, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So the lesson is not just relating to what we can eat, but it's now representing the fact that the gospel is not just for Jewish people, but for everyone, the whosoevers, all the Gentiles, as they decide to follow Jesus. So that's the chapters in a nutshell, but now we're going to go back to that sheet filled with four-footed animals, reptiles of the earth, and the birds of the air. Because God spoke to Peter through the use of these animals. Do you see that? He used these animals to convey a profound message that has changed the trajectory of history and actually affected our lives in a dynamic way because we are followers of Jesus. This is a, a sampling of some of the animals, some of the creatures that Peter would have seen in the sheep. These are all animals from the first century Israel or Palestine as it was called back then. And I used to, when I read this vision, I used to just imagine little things. But no, there'd be bigger creatures. It was everything. And so it must have been quite a sight for him to see inside that sheet and contemplate what it meant. And so God gives lessons using the animals of the earth, the sky, and the sea. And it's always been that way, hasn't it? Think about it for a sec. God has always spoken to, pe to people like you and I using the creatures that he created. Did God not use a large um, water creature, a mammal, or a big fish to swallow and vomit Jonah and teach him a lesson about obedience? Did God not use a donkey to speak and rebuke Balaam about unethical prosperity? He uses the creatures of this world. In six days, the Bible tells us, in Genesis 1, that God created everything that we know. Light and time, day two, the sky, separated waters, dry ground on day three, uh, and plants, day four, sun, moon, stars, planets, day five, fish and birds, day six, land animals and humans, and every day since, God has been using His creation to speak and to teach everyday people like you and I. And God sometimes takes the initiative, as He did with Jonah, the fish, as He did with Balaam, the donkey, as He did with Peter, the sheep filled with all these creatures. But we can take the initiative as well to look for the wisdom that God has implanted or imprinted in his creation. Listen to this passage. You might want to highlight it in your Bible. This is the response of Job to his friend's accusations. Job 12, verse 7 to 10. But ask the animals, and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. Do you see that God's creation reflects back to us his nature? That God's creation reflects the wisdom of God and gives us insight into how we ought to live our lives. Now this morning we could look at the universe, the planets and the stars, and how God is... is 
creatively and intelligently put it all together and how everything rotates in, in a pattern. We could look at plant life. I mean, Jesus said, consider the lilies. We could look at all sorts of layers of creation, but this morning, in keeping with Peter's vision, we're going to look at creatures, great and small. What do these creatures teach us about how we are to live our lives? Jeremiah 8, verse 7. Even the stork in the sky knows her appointed seasons. And the dove, the swift, and the thrush observe the time of their migration. But my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. We're to take our cue from these winged creatures to know the season that we're in and what the expectations of God in our lives are. They know, so should we. Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. The ant knows what season it is and uses the season wisely to prepare for the next. Don't you think there is a lesson for us in how we ought to live our lives? And that's why we're told to go to the ant. Proverbs 30, verses 24 to 28. Four things on earth are small, yet they're extremely wise. Ants, here we go with the ants again, are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Ants always know what season it is. And then it goes on, conies. Those are desert um, rodents, really. Conies are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags. It finds its safety in the shelter and the cover of a rock. Don't you think there's a lesson there for us? It knows where its safety is? Who's the rock of our salvation? Yeah. It goes on, locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. They find their strength in numbers. It's like the strength of the wolf is the pack. People say, I don't need to go to church in order to be a Christian. Well, if you have any intelligence, you will. You can't live a Christian life alone and survive. We need the body of Christ around us to inspire us and to keep us accountable. It's the lesson of the locust. And a lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it's found in the king's palace. What's a lizard doing in the king's palace? Well, I don't know. What are you doing in the kingdom of God? It's an image of grace. These animals, God's creatures, teach us about life and how we ought to live. Matthew 6, verse 25 to 27. This is Jesus. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? <clears throat> we're to look at the sparrows. We're to look at the ravens. God takes care of them. Why are we worrying about all the little details of our life. And then we can turn to Psalm 23 or Luke 15 where the shepherd goes after the sheep and we learn that sheep in and of themselves like us get lost, they need to be sought for, they need to be found, they need to be rescued, they need to be brought into a fold. Is God not teaching us about life through the animals? And not just for here and now, Here's a beautiful passage. Isaiah 11, verse 6 to 9. The wolf will live with the lamb. Is that normal? No. Nope. The leopard will lie down with the goat. Is that normal? No. Nope. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. bear in normal circumstances would have a good meal. It's not normal. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all, all, on all my holy mountain for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. 
This is looking forward to a future time when the Lord reestablishes His kingdom here on earth during the millennium. And animals that are, are presently violent will be brought into a unique relationship. There will be peace. And so God speaks to us about life now, life to come, through creation. Now, I'm about to show you something that at first you're going to think I'm being ridiculous. You're going to think the pastor is just being way too silly to take him seriously. I do have moments like that. It's my personality. But I'm being very serious this morning when I show you a few examples of some of the t-shirts that have been printed out that begin like this. Advice from A. Have you ever heard of that? Advice from A? We're going to go to the next, we'll go to the next one. That's advice from a horse. We're going to start with advice from a squirrel this morning. I'm trying to tell you, seriously, that every animal, every one of God's creatures has lessons to teach us. Now some of these are pushed a little far, I might admit. Look both ways before you cross the road. I think a squirrel doesn't know that well enough. But we should all, we ought to know that. Alright? Store up for bad times. That's the lesson of the ant again. It's okay to love nuts, just don't be one. Well, okay, Catherine. Uh, be bright, be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. You know, people who wake up in the morning and they're grumpy, say, there's no excuse. Put on a good attitude. Confuse, this is my favorite, confuse your enemy, change direction. There's wisdom in that, alright? And be quick. So, we're going to do a couple of these. Alright, let's go to another one here. Oh yeah, let's just remember the verse. But ask the animals, and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish of the sea, which will inform you. Let's go on. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, I want to stop at this one. Advice from a bear. This is my favorite. Live large. Climb beyond your limitations. When life gets hairy, grin and bear it. Eat well. All right, I'm good with that. Live with the seasons, my favorite. Take a good long nap. All right, and Susie, look after your honey. Aww. Aww. Okay. Well, some of them are, are, are a little pushing too far, but you can see that there's wisdom embedded in how a bear takes care of itself. Let's go on to another one. All right, what do we got? Let's go on to another one. The raven. We'll just do that randomly. Advice from a raven, because Jesus did talk about the raven. Be curious. Use your wits. Don't be a picky eater. Oh, man. I knew I shouldn't have done the raven. Take time to play. Be adaptable. Make your voice heard. And don't let life ruffle your feathers. This seems a little silly. But not really. Not really. Let's go on. Sled dog. Work as a team, pull your weight, love what you do, be warm-hearted, keep moving forward, howl with your friends. One more. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings and eagles. Right? What does this one say? Let your spirit soar. See the big picture. Cherish freedom. Honor the earth and sky. Keep your goals in sight. Balls. Say it, come on, everybody say it with me. Ball is fly high. That's a good one. I told you there was wisdom in this. <laughs> oh. But ask the animals and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. It's a little different kind of message today, isn't it, for Creation Sunday? Acts chapter 10, verse 11. And the sky opened up, and God lowered a sheep filled with four-footed animals, reptiles of the earth, birds of the sky. Peter looked in it, and God had a message. Van Morrison. He's a man who became a follower of Jesus back in the, uh, in the 90s. And he wrote some beautiful music, and you'll find his lyrics filled with allusions to faith in God. He writes this one song, When Will I Ever Learn to Live in God? I want to read you just the last 
portion of a lyric from it. And up on the hillside it's quiet where the shepherd is tending his sheep. And over the mountains and the valleys the countryside is so green. Standing on the highest hill with a sense of wonder, you can see everything is made in God. Head back down the roadside and give thanks for it all. And he goes on to say, when will I ever learn to live in God? When will I ever learn? He gives me everything I need and more. When will I ever learn? God speaks to us through everything around us. Now, Creation Sunday and other Christian faith traditions is, is more often called St. Francis of Assisi Day. Now, it's true that we here do not recognize persons as saints in the sense that they can be prayed to, that they can be venerated and worshipped. But Francis was a remarkable man, given over to intentional simplicity and poverty in his pursuit of God. He had a deep affinity with the created world, especially animals. And he would actually preach to the birds. He would go out and preach to animals. He commanded wolves, they said. Come to me, brother wolf, in the name of Christ. I order you not to hurt anyone. And it's said that the wolf would actually lay down at his feet. Now, I don't know what's folk folklore, what's true, but I do know that St. Francis stands out in history as a, man who saw God, as a man who saw God everywhere and in everything. And he invited creatures great and small to worship and to celebrate life in God with him. And Ignatian spirituality also calls us to look for God in all things, to listen to the birds, to listen to the sound of the wind, to look inside the cross section of a fell tree and to see the rings and to say, God, is there a lesson here for me? When the brothers of hermitages through medieval times would go for a walk through pastures and forest areas, whenever they would look up and see um, branches of a tree crossing in such a way that it looked like the cross of Christ, they would stop, they would pause, they would bow, and they would give thanks. Because they were looking for how God was speaking to them through the created world. Ask the animals. They'll teach you. The birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. And so we come to Acts chapter 10, 11. And God opened up the sky before Peter. And in a vision, something ecstatic, a sheet was lowered. And when it came down so low that Peter could look inside it, he had to look many times. There was creatures in there that were four-footed. There were reptiles. There were birds. And they weren't supposed to be together. If you read Leviticus 11. But God was speaking. And God said, through Jesus, I'm changing everything. The good news isn't just for the Jew. It's for Cornelius. It's for the whosoever's. It's creation Sunday. Let us give thanks. Heavenly Father, thank you for this simple and yet obvious reminder that you whisper to us through everything that's around us. And if we just take the time to look and to listen and to reflect, there's something inspiring and meaningful in direction there. So as your people, help us to think of the sparrows, to consider the lilies, to do what Jesus did all the time. To look to nature, to find meaning in life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.